Hello for my flare blitz and we have returned back to our adventures of Selena Apoptosis. The cars were scarce, but Ethan got them one in exchange for a coupon. Hope gave him a thumbs up with not bad, not bad at all expression on her face. Always good to get some freebies every now and then. Hope enthusiastically presents a huge, colourful, utterly ludicrous mug and Ethan immediately agreed they had to buy it. They tried to find a pair for the mug, but a prudent supermarket employee said it was the last one. For goodness sakes, now I'm gonna have to split this mug in half. They were a little disappointed, but well, at least it, that was something. For their shopping expedition. Looking for a mug was the thing that finally did the trick. Now they were huddled together looking for their favourite treats and arguing about which breakfast cereals are the best. Obviously, it's cornflakes. That's how it was until they reached the meat department. Ooh, I'll go pick something out before it's all cleared. Hope nodded absently. She was stuck at one of the big fridges in the middle of the hall. Okay, I'll be waiting for you here. Hopefully nobody is going to try and do any pickpocketing. The meat shelves were half empty, as usual at this hour. Ethan was hoping to find a steak or some minced meat. Uh, however, he soon forgot about both. <laughs> what the hell? Oh, that shadow again. There was a girl standing by one of the shelves. Oh, Ethan couldn't see her face. Only her pale black under a white dress with thin straps and also her dishevelled dark hair. Ethan's cheek was stunned with cold, as if his face was lying on the shelf in one of those refrigerated display cases. Oh no. Just between the pork ribs and the lone ribeye in a black polystyrene foam tray. Is that her? Ethan took a few uncertain steps forward. Then he backed away. Almost knocking over a nice old lady. He couldn't even muster an apology. God damn you, Ethan. Grabbed the first thing that came to hand and turned around the nearest row of shelves. He tried not to run because it would have looked too stupid. Ethan explained to himself as he re reached the end of the row and peered around the corner. The girl was still picking out meat. Isn't what you're doing now stupid too? For sure it is. Ethan agreed with himself. The cold no longer burned his cheek, and this girl, the girl, seemed quite ordinary. Except she was dressed too lightly for the current weather, but that was still not considered a crime in any of the states. Ethan smiled to his own thoughts. Generally speaking, the girl was rather attractive, and her light clothing allowed one to fully appreciate it. Her thin waist passing into a seductive curve on her li hips, or sorry, lips there, and beneath the folds of white fabric, one could make out one... What, what the hell? One could make out her rounded... Okay. Fun. Then, <laughs> Ethan, get out of your, of your stupor... What? I was asking broccoli or Brussels sprouts. Obviously, long-stemmed broccoli. Hope stood still with two colourful plastic bags in her hands, looking at Ethan questioningly. He blinked several times, squinting as if he had just stepped out into the bright light of a darkened room. When did he get back to Hope? Why was he holding a bottle of Thousand Islands dressing? I don't know. He was a little dizzy. Are you alright? No. <laughs> oh, yeah. God damn it, Ethan, be honest. Yeah. Never mind. I'm sorry. I was just lost in thought. I tried to not to look in the direction Ethan had been focusing for so long. She really tried, but sometimes trying is enough, no matter how much effort you put in. At that very moment, the dark-haired girl's light white dress was floating away from the meat shelves. She must have finally made her choice. I see. You see? For a moment, Ethan thought both colourful plastic bags were about to slap him in the face. But Hope just smiled and tossed the bags into the cart. 
even heard them crunch loudly as they hit the bottom. Well, let's take a bath. Let's, did you say let's take a bath or let's take both? Variety is the spice of life. Hmm. If you say so, but sometimes the lines do not match up with the voices. What is a man without his zucchini? They haven't brought the zucchini. As they were... That was their primary goal, wasn't it? That night, he had another dream about the white room. Great, the white room again. The walls were still trembling softly in the cold light. Everything in the room, including the air, was oozing tension. Anguishing in anticipation of what was about to happen. And something was really about to happen, no doubt about it. Ooh. Ethan suddenly realized he was looking at the room from an odd angle. He seemed to be standing on something. But he couldn't feel anything under his feet. No support. He tried to look down, but only saw the simmering air. He had no legs. And nothing above the missing legs. It's almost as if we're an NPC in a video game. Or just a character in a video game without a model. As if he was not there. But his consciousness was. Rather, he was the simmering air. The clipped, sorry, the chipped ceiling and the walls that were still trembling. He was red sofa standing a little away from the center. And a couple of unremarkable white doors on opposite walls of a room that were not there the last time. And that should not have been there. Nothing can be done about it now. Me and my red sofa. The doors have appeared. And there's nothing that can be done about it now. What's going on, dear Ethan? The light grew dim, now pulsating noticeably. It was still inanimating in at that word, from the room in its entirety, reflecting from the white walls, but most of all from the twin bra on the wall between two doors that were not supposed to be. For some reason, Ethan tried to catch the rhythm of the light with his breath, but yet he couldn't. There were two figures sitting on the sofa. One fair, the other dark. The dark one came into the room through one of the doors, but Ethan couldn't guess which one. What are you talking about? The fair one was Hope. Ah, these two. Hope, what are you doing? You can't be here. You have to leave right now or something will happen. The pulse of light became faster. The Dark One moved towards Hope and tucked a blonde strand behind her ear. What are you hoping to do, Dark One? Everything was happening very slowly, as if underwater. There was something odd about the Dark One. Something about her was wrong, but even couldn't guess what. Mm, she leaned towards Hope's ear and covered her mouth with her hand. And Hope leaned towards her and listened very carefully, as if they had a mutual secret among themselves. So it was about to happen. They both looked at Ethan, even though Ethan wasn't here, or rather he was nowhere, because no white room ever existed. Then one of them smiled. The Dark One's fingers slid down Hope's chin, a soft rounded line. They were no longer looking at Ethan, only at each other, very closely, and were slowly inhaling the light. Ooh. Ah, now they are touching lips. The Dark One stroke Hope's cheek, as there was no light left between their ajar lips as they collided. Ethan saw drops of saliva glistening on their lips. The Dark One licked her lips and raised her tongue to make a space for a long black snake as it got out of her mouth. Oh gosh. The snake swayed, twisted the air with his own tongue and reached out to Hope. Hope closed her eyes. Now the snake was stroking her cheek, long and black, over and over again, in a spiral. Always in a spiral. 
Hope reached for the fan that covered her eyes, and the dark girl reached for her hand, and their fingers intertwined and the light between their lips melted, as it always happens at sunset. Yet there was no snake. It was just a black ribbon. A poisonous ribbon, covered in scales. The pulse of the room became faster. It also came, so it became a little more distorted. One of the lamps came into an eclipse. She has a number of faces. That's a clue. The bodies of two girls merge on the red sofa, and his own flesh was shaking and shrinking if he had any. Ligaments, value, sorry, valves, bones, vessels in places where they came very close to a shabby red upholstery. His heart rate became faster. Faster. Faster! Oh. And then something happened. Ethan woke up, enjoying its sofa. His breath was bubbling in his throat. The scene above him was flaring with immeasurable darkness. And down below his stomach, he felt a searing heat. The heat was so much, Ethan had to sneak into the bathroom, and as his old man used to say, he had to squeeze it off. And not just once, but whopping two. After that, Ethan loomed over the sink and was looking at himself in a small rectangular mirror for quite a while, and hoped that that figure does not reappear. At some point, his lips started trembling. Ethan did not wait to see where this was going. He spanned to the sink, let the water in for a while, then he turned the lights off. What's looming around here then? Oh no, nothing. Ethan didn't want morning to come, something's changed. He didn't want to wake up, to see a hidden grudge in Hope's eyes. To listen to the awkward silence and to seize every opportunity to say a word to break it. But morning did come and Ethan was in for a surprise. Everything was fine. Very much so. Why wouldn't it? Hope got up early to make a superior breakfast. The kind Ethan was never able to cook. Even when he really wanted to. She was talking to him. She was joking. She listed at least 10 places they would go when their schedules became more relaxed. The nightmare seemed to be over. Simply washed away down the drain with the rest of all things excess he used to have in his body. The image was so real that Ethan got completely relaxed, let his guard down, dazed by the cute nonsense waffles with cream and delicious Turkish coffee. What makes Turkish coffee particularly out? standish in comparison to other kinds of coffee. Actually, they drink more tea than any other country in the world by capital. Then Hope asks a question. Do you think a darker hair color would suit me? Why do you think... Why did you say that? <laughs> why did you say that, Hope? Was that referring to the girl that I was whimsically in a facade uh, uh, staring towards last night? The coffee suddenly turned solid and stuck in his throat. Even felt as if it wasn't coffee at all, but finely ground glass. He coughed. What? I put her elbows on the table and sipped from her cup as if nothing had happened. I was just thinking of becoming a brunette. Ah, a darker color of yours, but not black. What do you say? Huh? I hope you said the brunette pearls first. I don't know. I'm fine with everything as it is. As long as you like it, I guess. Tiny piece of glass was still scratching him from the inside. If I tried to clear his throat, but it didn't get much better. But why were you thinking about it? He even struggled to speak. He felt as if he was falling into a pit and the air was whistling in his ears. Well, one has to change from time to time. I guess? Variety is good, isn't that right? You said something about variety just earlier as well. She took another sip. Besides, I find plenty of dark hair all over the apartment. 
Hmm, yeah, that is rather concerning, is it not? Does that cat figure appear in the night, then? Not very long, you know. But not too short, either. That, I swear that's not me. That thing, whatever it is, keeps appearing. It's nothing to do with me, Hope. About this length? Even before Hope tapped her neck with the edge of her hand, even knew where the hand would stop. And so I thought, if I go brunette, I can believe those hairs are mine. That sounds dumb, and you know it is. That's really dumb, Hope. Like, why would you think that by changing your hair color, you can deceive yourself into thinking that the hair that you find on the floor, which is definitely not from you, is somehow you? Hope's lips stretched and the corners of her mouth turned up, but she wasn't smiling. This isn't happening. This just can't be happening. He must still be asleep. This is a dream. Just a crap dream. And it will end. Now Ethan desperately wanted morning to come, but morning just couldn't come for the second time in a day. Hope leaned back in her chair and looked at him with her side, with her head on one side, a fake smile smoldering on her lips. Something had to be done about it. All of it. Right this moment. Try to explain. Look, something strange is going on. Yeah, I could tell as much. Hope, I'm serious. Something strange is going on and I have no explanations. Neither good nor bad. None at all. Oh, really? Yes. Actually, I have an idea or two. And what would that be, Hope? Wait, I'm not saying that yesterday in the store Ethan stopped short. Go on. He took a deep breath and closed his eyes. I'm not saying I didn't stare at that girl. I did, and it's obvious. I was trying to... She reminds me of someone, and I was trying to figure out if I was mistaken. I know what it looks like, and it's my fault. Ethan decides to omit the part about well-rounded buttocks under the light flow fabric. <laughs> yeah. Not because he wanted to look better, because he knew it would hurt Hope, and he really didn't want to hurt her. Please forgive me if you can. I did a crap thing, but I'm really sorry. He put his hand on the table so the fingers touched a little. Hope he didn't move away. Next time we go shopping. <laughs> you can stare at everyone you like. That doesn't resolve the issue at hand, though. <laughs> That's not a resolution. That's not saying, oh, because I cheated on someone, that means you can cheat on me. As <laughs> like that. Two and two doesn't go together. I'll try my best not to cry. Can't promise anything, though. Hope wins, but Ethan knew she was hiding a smile. All right, then. But keep in mind, I'll pick the hottest ones. Okay, go on then, Hope. I don't stand a chance, do I? <laughs> she smiled wider and ruffled his hair. Absolutely. <laughs> and about the hairs. Hope's smile disappeared without a trace. I don't know where they come from. Seriously, there's something wrong here. Ethan, please. I don't want to. No, listen, please. I really think that some intruder is getting inside our apartment somehow. Do you believe me? Hope looked at him for a while. Then she shivered. Damn you, Ethan. Yes. I do believe you. Thanks. I don't understand how this happens or what they want, but I think it's time to call the police. And let them sort it out. It's their job after all. Maybe you should actually call Laura first. I think it's the time. No, we call the police first. You saw the hair as well. You saw the hair as well, Hope. You put up the hair in the first place. Yes, I'll do that as well. Hope pressed his hand. Let's promise each other we won't go crazy. Okay. I'll do my best. I can't guarantee, but I'll do my best. I also see things. Like what? All sorts of things. Like what? I mean, sometimes you find hair. Just some damn hairs. And you start questioning everything. Hope had the inclination that Ethan was cheating on Hope with that black-haired cat girl. We just need to get through these dark times, somehow. 
It'll get better. I'm sure it will. Ethan nodded. Yeah. I pressed his hand again and got up from the table. Okay. I have to go now. I'll probably be late. And we'll have to hold up at work today. How comes? Should I meet you after? Maybe. What do you mean maybe? I'll call you later, I guess. Hope? Hmm? I love you. I love you too. Very much. <laughs> Don't forget to call Laura. Even nodded absently. But why Laura? When the door shut behind Hope, Ethan called Laura. Hope found Laura a long time ago. Seemed like Laura helped her a lot. At least that's what Hope herself said. Ethan didn't know any details nor wanted to. Since Hope hadn't told him. After all, psychotherapy is a very personal matter. So personal that Ethan, so Ethan felt as if he were standing naked in the middle of a busy street when he had to describe what was happening to him. Apparently, one could get used to this too, as by the middle of the story he was sparing no details. To even surprise, when he mentioned the disturbing emails from his contacts that were kind of getting on his nerves, Laura perked up. You're saying you have recently become quite close to your acquaintance. You empathize and try to help him, right? Well, yes, something like that. And your contacts' letters contained vivid, disturbing imagery, yes? Imagery that invokes a certain response from you. Is that right? You can say that. He's a writer, after all. Vivid images are his livelihood. Ooh. What? Do you know what induced delusional disorder is, Mr. Harrison? He even tried to recall. He definitely read about it but didn't look into much detail. Is that the theme that explains mass insanity? Like the Dancing Plague of 1580 in Strasbourg? That's right. This disorder is also called Folie a Deluxe, or Madness for Two. I don't know how to pronounce that. I don't understand French. Sounds romantic, doesn't it? Lord giggled. Even, he said, even thought she herself was not all too sane. Of course she wasn't. She had to deal with the guys like me all the time. But Laura had already returned to her usual turn, sorry, tone, calm and measured. This condition causes perfectly healthy people to experience various, let's say, negative e effects. It works like this. We have a source of delirium, sorry, a delirium and those who perceive it, one or more people. As you correctly noted, sometimes this disorder can take on a truly massive scale. There is an, sorry, there is usually an emotional connection between the victims of this condition. Your wife is also at risk, unfortunately. Laura paused. I can't make a diagnosis, diagnosis in such a format, Mr. Harrison. However, I think you need to limit contact with your acquaintance, at least for the time being. He might be the source of the unpleasant state you are experiencing. Would you like to make an appointment for a consultation? Are you going to say yes? Oh, Ethan politely declined. Why? Laura listened to the rest of what he had to say. She asked what pills Ethan was taking. Ethan wasn't taking any except aspirin because he has had lots of headaches lately. She advised him reduce the workload, follow the daily routine, and take light sedatives if necessary. Something herbal, maybe. Without meeting in person, there wasn't much Laura could offer, and Ethan had no energy, time, or money to start the full-on therapy, as Hope called it. Yeah, therapy is really expensive, no matter where you are in the world. Ethan thanks Laura with all of his heart, finished the call, stretched, and took a deep breath that made his ribs ache. Then he smiled. Though no full-on therapy was involved, this conversation still made Ethan feel much better. The reality made sense again, and nothing out of the ordinary was happening. Nothing he couldn't handle. He stretched again and was about to go for another cup of coffee when his breath... The steady, deep breath of a man who's in control 
corners throat. Even felt the small hairs on his neck standing up. Someone was looking at the back of his head. Even turned around slowly. And it was there. I'm calling the police. Even spoke each word loud and clear. It was a decent plan. An actually decent one. And it, was, and it certainly wasn't funny in any way. And yet the girl standing on the window still was silently laughing. Covering white teeth with her hand. The girl from the supermarket. The girl from the dream. She was still wearing a light white dress even though in the morning the temperature dropped to 53 degrees Fahrenheit and it was going to rain. One of her straps fell down to the side but the girl was in no hurry to put it back. She swung her cross legs a little, looking at Ethan from under her brow with a smile of a child who had a hilarious mischief in mind. Did I say something funny? The girl quickly raised her eyes and shrugged slightly, still holding back the smile. Just before, she did not make a sound. Ethan even assumed she could be mute, but decided to make one last attempt. Just one question, and then he calls the cop. How did you get in here? The girl put her lean finger with a neat black nail to her lips, while the fingers of her other hand shaped a figure of a man. She pointed at the figure with her eyes. He even felt sick of the farce that was happening. He thought he should call the cops immediately, the hand clutching the phone continued to hang limply. The finger man looked around and started walking along the window, slow with his finger legs. One, two, three. Then something else happened. Ethan failed to understand what it was. The next moment, the finger man was walking on the sill, and the girl was making it with her other hand. Then she smiled widely and put both palms on her chest. She looked absolutely happy. I was invited. No, you were not invited. Suddenly, she cast a gloomy look at Ethan. Her black eyes gave a cold glimmer. It's really rude to come in without an invitation. A moment later, the girl reached for something behind her back, quickly poured it to her lips and took a sip. Ethan's throat became tight with blood that abruptly rushed to his head. Where? How did you get this? The girl traced Ethan's gesture with a genuinely surprised look, and the next moment she passed her fingers. Oh, what the? Hope's huge colorful cup, the one they just got at the store, tinkled hurtfully as it struck the floor and then shattered to pieces. Just like that. There was a brief moment where the cup was lying peaceful on the floor, even got enough time to hope it would endure the fall, and then the fragments burst everywhere at once, as the furious white light broke out from the inside. But no, that was milk. Just some milk. You shouldn't have spooked me, you know. You shouldn't have entered my house without our permission. You are an intruder, girl. Now look at what you've done. The poor cup is so, so broken. So many eeny, meeny, tiny pieces. There's no way to mend it at all. <laughs> Even was suffocating. What the hell are you doing here? What do you want from me? The girl bit her lip and twists a fallen shoulder strap between fingers. The top of her dress slid even lower, for goodness Do you sakes. Want me to leave? Yes! But I may run into Hope. Right at the door, Ethan. She forgot her pass and will be here any minute. Really? What will the poor girl think? <sighs> the girl looked over her shoulder and her face instantly lit up. <gasps> it's her! Here she is! Hope is simply amazing, accurate to a minute. Hello, hello! The girl turned over on her stomach, leaned on the sill and waved vigorously to someone invisible. Her dress completely slid down. A blank even would... Anyways. Don't come any closer, you know. Hello, Hope. Ethan couldn't see it, but he knew he felt that Hope was really standing down there. And she was looking at the window, of course, although she couldn't see much anymore. 
as a blurry veil covered her eyes. The girl slowly turned around and stared at him with her eyes wide open without blinking. Her shoulder shook as if she was going to cry, but she was laughing. At first, it was a couple of stifled laughs. Then it became a laughter of someone who just heard a, giant, a great joke and gradually turned into wild barking screams. He had to stop it. Right now, Eva wanted to rush to the window, but took just one step and froze in place. The girl must be out of her mind. She's stoned or worse. She might have a syringe. And he doesn't want any more problems. And he wants things removed from his windowsill, wheeled in a steel box and dumped somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic. He still had his phone in his hand. Oh. 9-11, what's the address of your emergency? That blank. The hunched. They kept cackling like a pack of coyotes yelping on a moonlit night. She was reefing with laughter. And the pale rags of dry, flabby skin were shaking in the rhythm of her movements. A dress looking like a death shroud. He suddenly thought she was much older than he thought at first. What is going on? Ethan looked at her for the last time, a mixture of hate and disgust in his eyes, and turned away, running his fingers through his hair. There is a stranger in my apartment. A woman, most likely on drugs or just insane. Can you see her now, right now? Ethan could only see the wall in front of him, but he heard a deafening howl. It was echoing throughout his skull, beaten into the temporal bones like a desperate bone. Bird, sorry. Ethan clenched his teeth. Yes. Does she have a weapon? Maybe. She threatened me. Can you leave the apartment? No. This scum can escape, and I don't want her to get... Ethan hesitated. I can't hear you, sir. What is happening? Speak up. I can't hear you. What is happening? The terrifying laughter kept echoing in Ethan's ear. There was no one behind him. This girl only causes trouble wherever she goes. He approached Winner softly, as if it was happening in a dream. The shards of Hope's cup crunched under his feet, just like before the window was closed. He even opened it and carefully looked down. He did not see the body. Too good to be true, but he had to check. Only the grey pavement, which gradually turned black as it actually started raining. Ethan looked across the street, just in time to notice a familiar cream-coloured coat disappearing behind the corner of a nearby house. And then there's Hope, who's, who's crying. He screamed so loud that something snapped in his throat, but she didn't hear him. Or maybe she didn't want to hear Ethan called her at least a hundred times. Hope didn't answer. Ethan thought he could make he could come to her office, but eventually decided it would only make things worse. The police were in his apartment 20, 30, 23 minutes, 40 seconds. Yeah, 40 seconds later, sorry. They didn't find any signs of forced entry, and the call record, as Ethan found out later, had nothing that resembled laughter or howling. No extraneous sounds, as the officer said. And there's still that look in Hope's eyes. One that says, I'm leaving you, Ethan. We're done. Hope returns sometime between late at night and early in the morning. The skin on her cheekbones were taut and almost transparent. And there were deep shadows under her eyes as if she hadn't slept in a long time. She smiled of strong alcohol, even went out of the dark room to her. He didn't sleep and didn't turn on the light either. Things that lurked in the dark, real or imagined, no longer frightened him. He even wished that something had been, he had been dreading for the past month, he finally could name the fiend that he had, would come out of the greasy blackness of the shadows and snap his neck but everything in the apartment was mockingly calm, except for Ethan himself. Hope? 
Hope stared at him in silence, swaying a little. Instead of people, she had dark holes. I've been thinking a lot about what I would say to you if you came back. What I can say. Hope's face showed no emotion. It seemed like she didn't even blink. Anyway, I realized that I can only tell the truth, no matter how crazy it sounds. If I try to cheat, it only gets worse, right? Even gave a short, nervous laugh. Anyway, even had plenty of time to think about what he was going to say, but he still didn't know where to start. Some time ago, I don't remember exactly, I started seeing a girl. Who is she, Ethan? I don't know. I do not have clear, concise answers for that one. Is it Sophie? Who? Sophie Wolf, your student from that online course. Hope made a vague gesture of her hand. Movies from the late Victorian era. Ethan didn't know why he said that, but Hope obediently repeated it in a flat voice. I remember you were impressed with her. You always liked smart girls, and this one was also beautiful. Hope, this isn't this isn't what you think. Think. Who says I think? Thinking's too painful. Wait, hold on. Ethan disappeared into the room and came back a few minutes later. The darkness of a hallway was diluted by the light of a screen. Hope covered her eyes with her hand, either from the brightness of the screen itself or because she didn't want to see whatever there was. What is it all about? Here, yeah, look. It's Sophie Wolf. On the screen, in fact, was the profile of Sophie Wolf, his student. On the photo, Sophie was squinting. Either from the bright sun or because her curly red hair was getting in her eyes. A small brown haired girl snuggled up to her with a shy smile. They're a nice couple. If I remember correctly, they had a wedding this year. Then. Who is. I don't know. And honestly, I don't care. I just want her out of my life. But this individual follows me well she used to follow but now i don't think i don't think i'll ever see you again is it good or bad hope please if you want to leave i'll understand but if if you're willing to give me a chance i promise to do my best to mend it all i don't think you can really mend all of it but he couldn't really promise but he was too eager for a nightmare or real or imagined to finally end no more weird stories Please, Hope. I don't need anyone but you. If you can get... He couldn't finish because Hope kissed him. Her bag hit the floor with a thud. The rest of the night actually went fine. Well, even more than that, except for the fact they were too busy to get any sleep. At least everything was going okay until the moment when, instead of Hope's face for just a moment, Ethan saw... He couldn't tell... He mumbled something about not feeling well and collapsed on his back, panting. He closed his eyes so that Hope wouldn't accidentally catch a glimpse of what he saw. Nothing happened. It wasn't real. It's fine, she understands, said Hope. Something changed again. Ethan sat in front of his laptop staring at the monitor. The concave muzzles of Persian cats stared back at him. All that was required of Ethan... He had to call the cattery. A simple task, but Ethan hesitated. It was hard for him to get used to the idea of one of those pop-eyed creatures walking around their apartment. During the day, it will nap where it pleases, and at night, sneak into the kitchen to play with the shadows that move by themselves. And their eyes will turn into two saucers of black and green nakri if the light reaches them. Ancient people believed cats could walk between worlds in the spirits, or a sea spirit, sorry. Looking at Persians, Ethan hardly believed they could even breathe on their own. And yet, in this, Ethan Harrison for the 21st century agreed with the ancient people. There was something sinister about them. In any case, he should call the cattery, for hope's sake, for the sake of them both, since he had made the decision. Ethan had already picked up the phone and was about to proceed with the plan when he heard the key turning the entrance door. 
Uh oh. Something about that wound him up. It was barely five o'clock in the evening, which was in any way very early for Hope to be back. If everything was fine, that is. Ethan closed his laptop and went into the hallway. Ooh. For a long time, we couldn't say a single word. And when he could speak again, he only managed one question. What have you done? Hope's smile faded, and for the first time in the four and a half, or even so five years, they'd been a couple, Ethan was glad of it. What? Oh, she changed her hair color, or that is Sophie Wolf. In fact, there was nothing surprising about it. As with a new haircut and the new hair color, Hope looked unbearably, insanely similar to that creature at the window. Hope's lips turned white, trembling. This didn't help, did it? Any of it? You can't love me even now, right? What? What are you talking about? Isn't it obvious? I see how you look at me. You're disgusted. You try your best to touch me as little as possible. And no matter what I do, no matter what I try, it doesn't help. Admit it. Never loved her. Oh gosh, but now her voice has become distorted. You didn't write Ethan. She was convenient and that's about it. Damn it. No, not the voices. Shit makes the flowers grow. Your flowers grew so much, didn't they, Ethan? Didn't they? Ethan would never hit his wife. More than that, he would never hit a woman, but what spooked to him was neither his wife nor a woman. It was a nightmare incarnate that bared its long, sharp teeth and came to take away his right for a second chance. Or so even thought at the time. The punch turned into somewhat pathetic. But you, you have to take into account that wife beating is not a fair ground attraction. When you have hit your wife properly, a mark does not fly up to the highlighted sign, a good one, no. The only sign that comes up when you hit someone like that is, you have truly cocked up. Although this was only indirectly related to the only renaissance, even had expertise in the matter since his old man's fists used to itch often. If there was something like that, he would know. However, if any sign could light up at the moment, it would say something like, You're scum, Ethan. No! He kept repeating that even after Hope stormed out the door in tears. Oh dear. Yeah, that was a really bad thing you'd done there, Ethan. But then again, her changing to that kind of outfit with the hair of the black, well, of the uh, Sophie Wolf, and then having the length of her hair, as in, like, say, well, you prefer me if I look like her, but now that I look like her, you're disgusted by me. Ethan barely remember the following few days. Something seemed to be happening. Some people called him. He himself called a lot. He called Hope. Hope wasn't answering the phone. He knew this would happen. Every time he dialed her number, he knew he'll end up listening to the voicemail signal. It became something of a ritual. He would wake up, sometimes it was light outside, sometimes dark, but more often it was something grey he neither could nor would want to identify because of the drawn curtains. He'd call Hope. Hope wouldn't answer the phone. He would go to the kitchen and turn the water on. He'd watch the silvery twisted stream break against the sink for a while. Eventually, he'd put a cup under the stream, fill it to the brim, drink, go to the bathroom, back to the couch. It's too bad to be true. All of this can't be real. Life can't crumble into pieces in an instant, just collapse inwards like a wooden block tower. Ethan couldn't remember the name of that game. One he and Hope want to see. He and Hope. It's too bad. What if this can't be real? He didn't do anything. Could it be that he didn't do anything? No. He hit Hope. He hit her, and a red blot spread across her cheek. 
It was too dark to see, but Ethan knew how it goes. How could he do that? What happens now? What can happen now? These thoughts were like a bunch of needles he tried to swallow over and over. Sometimes he managed to briefly forget about them. It would happen when he woke up in the grey timelessness, looked at the dirty white ceiling and didn't remember who that Ethan Harrison was. But the pain would always come back. He had a bunch of needles in his throat, and no matter how much water he drank, he couldn't get rid of it. Hope's father shook him up a bit. Not in a sense he could have done it, grabbing hold of him, lifting off the ground. Hope's father was a tough man, and despite his age, he could have hit Ethan hard. Ethan was afraid of it, and at the same time he wanted it to happen. That would have made everything easier. Maybe even fixed it all. No. Ethan was going over in his head and he star stared at the phone screen, displaying a familiar name. Is that Hope? He was awfully scared, yet he answered. It turned out Hope had asked her father to pack up for her. Mr. Mirrily's voice was flat, maybe even a bit uncertain. And worst of all, he wasn't angry. This plunged Ethan into despair. He couldn't get his redemption like this. But... I think that point is just too far gone. But yet the horrific voice that Hope had there was taunting him. However, the upcoming visit forced Ethan to gain his senses. It shoved him back into reality like a stream of people pushing one into a crowded subway train. He tied up the place a bit. He shaved. He figured out what to say. Several times he rehearsed his speech in front of a mirror. And just before Mr. Mirrilees arrived, Ethan left the keys with the neighbors. Simply put, he fled. Of course, he warned Mr. Mirrilees beforehand with a message because he didn't have the heart to call. Ethan wanted Mr. Mirrilees to pick up what he had to and get out as soon as possible. Mr. Mirrilees wasn't going to help, that's for sure. He wasn't going to help which meant he simply got between Ethan and his wife. Ethan was angry with Mr. Mirrilees, like he was the source of all the trouble. Anger was boiling up inside him, mixed with cheap, so mixing with cheap coffee and turning it into caustic acid. There was nothing rational about this feeling. Ethan had plenty of time to think about it, to weigh it, to examine it under a magnifying glass. He was sitting in a small cafe on the corner of the street until the streets got dark. He would have stayed there even longer if a waiter hadn't come to his table to tell the place was closing. Ethan nodded absentmindedly and asked for a moment to use the bathroom. Again, there was nothing rational about being angry with Mr. Mirrilees. And to be honest, it was pathetic. Just like hitting your wife and then running away not to face her father. You're scum, Ethan. Worthless scum. Ethan turned off the tap and stared at his reflection in a large mirror. A few drops of water trembled on the tip of his nose and chin. And cracks. Now that was a proper punch. Sir, I'm sorry, but we... Sir? Are you okay? You have... Blood oozed from his split lip. Ethan wrapped it with... <laughs> wrapped it with the back of his hand. Yes? Yes, I'm fine. I don't look fine. So I didn't mean to keep you. He smiled. The flesh wound got swollen with blood again. A red blot spread across his face just as it should. What were you thinking by doing that? Ethan didn't lie to the waiter. Something's changed indeed again. He really was fine. Maybe not in the same manner as before, but the gears in the head were starting to move again. When he got home, Mr. Millies had already left. Turned out that he didn't even take the keys from the neighbors. At first, Ethan assumed Mr. Mirrilees could cancel the visit, but as soon as he opened the door, his doubts disappeared. A strong, unfamiliar scent was filling the hallway. It could be Mr. Mirrilees' cogni, or maybe the smell of the apartment itself, with Hope's presence faded away. Mr. Mirrilees must have taken his daughter's keys. Somehow, the possibility never crossed Ethan's mind before. Yeah, exactly. He drew the air in through his nostrils and suddenly felt as sharp as 
sorry, and clear as in that dream he had days ago. Something was going on, going to happen. Ethan looked around the empty dark room and reached for the phone. Was it to perform a ritual, or was he hoping something would go different this time? Short beeps. Even thought it was safe to say something was already happening. He only had to figure what and where. These Mona Lisa paintings, sorry. Something had changed in the picture. And it's not that Hope's favorite blouse is missing from the closet. If you find the difference, you win. If you find the difference, you know where the gears are taking you. Well, it's the two ladies aside the Mona Lisa there. The hallway. Pop bellied poles, sorry, bowl, sorry, on the dresser. Full of gibberish and dust. The kitchen. Well, something's going on in the kitchen. There, there are eyes. And they are both looking inwards. An uneven row of glass jars on a shelf. An empty coffee maker bearing dry blackness at the bottom. Spoons, forks, and knives, some of them really sharp. The bathroom. A mirror on the wall. And in reflection, the closed door is open. No, not here. What about... Ethan licked his split lip. Yes, that's it. He has to check his email now. Ethan was looking carefully. Seemed like a lot of time had passed. His mailbox was full of various emails, but Ethan barely glanced at the names. He was looking for something special. And what was special about saying letters from the agency that were gradually becoming more and more concerned? At some point, concern turned into cold and aggressive. Ethan idly skimmed through the notice of contract termination. Not what he was looking for. He started with the oldest emails and scanned the way, sorry, the list all the way to the top. Nothing. Maybe he's looking in the wrong place. Maybe there's just nothing to look for. No, something is happening. He only has to figure what and where. Ethan got so close to the accurate answer to those questions. But the light of new knowledge, sorry, new knowledge, could have burned out his eyes. At the top of the list was an untitled letter. Maybe Ethan missed it for the first time, or maybe it just wasn't there before. The sender was the same writer Ethan had volunteered, so volunteered to help, completely free of charge. Ethan's lungs turned into a deflated bull pool. He clicked on the name of the letter without a name. Of course, the letter actually had a name. Male client, so yeah, male clients carefully added untitled to the empty line, sorry. Just in case you're losing it when you type your email, because something got out of that open door in the bathroom mirror. The poor guy begged Ethan to come. The male said he couldn't sleep. He was scared, exhausted, and didn't know where else to ask. Something will get him very soon, if he won't figure anything out. He didn't know if it was related to the work he was doing. He didn't know how to drive away what had settled in his house. He only knew that something enormously hungry was looking at him from the darkness. You know what I mean, right? Ethan knew. By the time he finished reading the letter, Ethan already knew what he should do. Answer the call. The acquaintance didn't know if it had any real relation to the work he was doing. But what about Ethan's work? Could his research shed light on what lay dormant in the dark and awaken it? Was it Ethan's avid curiosity or the question that teased his appetite? Which one was cursed, the chicken or the egg? Ethan was angry. Angry as hell. He wants to end it. All of it, once and for all. He wants to face his fear, even if the fear was no longer his own. Even if it was crawling through the wires and climbing communication towers to breathe out its noxious spores into the air. Oh, there are eyes on the painting. Ethan was angry, but also terrified. 
What he wanted to think was a delusion took root and grew stronger as he tried to deceive himself. It was an incorporeal as the email in his mailbox, yet yeah, at the same time as real. Even wants to face the fear so that it would take a shape and a name, a box in which that fear could fit. Maybe then he could have dealt with it. That's why when Ethan got behind the wheel of his old sedan, he wasn't doing it for the writer who was tormented by shadows. He was doing it for himself. In the email, the acquaintance described in detail how to find his house and how to get inside. Too much detail. As if he had already resigned to his fate. Something would get to him very soon. And he won't figure anything out. This is just a notice, Mr. Hand Sir Harrison. A notice of life termination. This happens when you look into the abyss for too long. Did the moon have its own eye there? But looking isn't enough, is it? You shine a flashlight into it, through stones, and whistle frantically, like a vandal who managed to get into an abandoned house. You're excited and terrified, and then only terror remains as you realize the door has slammed shut behind you, and the handle won't budge. That's not creepy at all. Are we going further and further? This thought made even speed up, and then just abruptly to hit the brakes. The wheels let out a short hysterical shriek. The car swerved and stopped on the side of the road. The blood was pounding in his ears. Ethan's breath came in short gasps, his eyes searching blindly in the dark. After coming down a little, Ethan pretended who he was trying Who was he trying to fall? The night road was empty. He was examining his navigator, but there was but one thought in his head. And what would that thought be? What is he doing? What the hell is he doing? Seems like he asked it out loud. There was no one to answer. It's not too late to turn back. Turn the car around, go back to the city, to the apartment, lie down on the sofa and sleep, sleep, sleep until the morning comes. In the morning, he would call hope again and the thought was cut short. <clears throat> Just like the line was cut short. Actually, he didn't need anywhere from the very beginning. A dead end. The truth was, he had no place or reason to go back. He wanted to go back to the past. And that task was beyond him or his old Toyota. In the present, he had nothing left but the granite grey road ahead and the decision to go. If he hurried, he might still be able to help. So his car was on its last legs. The car slowly took off. The rest of the way, and there wasn't much left, even was thinking about his acquaintance. Well, were they friends? Probably. You don't take acquaintances for a journey to the bottom of the abyss, do you? Ethan was thinking about his friend. How long he'd been awake in particular. It had been... Ethan glanced at the phone in the open glove box quite a long time. A, mo oh, sorry, a month or so, judging by the emails. How long can a person stay awake? The question followed his car silently. question followed his car. Ethan drove into the suburbs and turned the car around on Deputy Road. The 25 miles per hour speed limit road sign at the bend of the road seemed as white as an old bone. Ethan turned down Sycamore Street, which I believe is where the original protagonist lives. The lawn in front of the house eight was overgrown with tall grass. So tall, as if he hadn't been touched for... How long could a person stay awake? Even thought it was probably the rainy weather. He didn't remember much of the past week, but he was pretty sure about the rain. Even now, the ground was still damp and springy underfoot. Yeah, it must be the rain. Humidity makes grass grow faster. 
When he got out of the car, a shadow detached from the trees near the house. Ethan stiffened, then eased a moment later. The figure quickly walked away along the narrow concrete path. Just a passerby. Ethan watched him go. The concrete beneath his boots gave way to gravel. Ethan walked past a spooling hemlock covered with rosettes of small white flowers. The bush reached up to mid-thigh. All the windows were dim. No lights anymore. The house stood a little way off. Dark, quiet and still as the night itself. Almost like the house was stumbling along with its host. For a moment, Ethan felt stupid and was about to turn back to the car. But he stayed after all. He was invited. No, not that. He was called for help. Maybe he and his friend got a little too stressed and that's all. Induced delusional disorder in all its glory. Maybe Ethan was desperate to be needed, so he jumped at the chance to be someone's saviour. Perhaps his unfortunate friend had finally fallen asleep and disturbing him was a bad decision overall. Well, Ethan was fine with that. He just wanted to make sure everything was okay. Ethan firmly knocked, knocked on the door. No one answered. Neither the first time nor the third. No lights came on in any of the rooms and there was no sound behind the door. One of the windows on the second floor was open. Ethan moved away from the porch and tried to take a better look. Sorry, better look. No movement. The house was asleep and its sleep resembled torpor. Even himself came to think he might be dreaming. But if two people share the same dream, same dream too, is it any different from reality? Dream. Slowly, as if that really was a dream, Ethan went to the flower tub the letter had mentioned and took the spare key from its hiding place. Just as slowly he returned to the door. The key rattled three times in the lock and the door drifted inward into the darkness. At the top of the stairs leading to the second floor, there sat a cat. He even tried to call it out to it, but the cat didn't move, still watching him with bright round eyes. Even plunged into the darkness of the house. The darkness and the stench, which were almost one and the same here. The smell, unbearably thick, dense, wrapped the house in a suffocating shroud. He even tried not to think about where it was coming from. Instead, he thought of Celine, or rather, her dark counterpart, Ikat. The ancient Greeks believed that she appears in the form of a dog. The dogs were sacrificed to her, weren't they? Better turn the light on. It was really better to, but Ethan couldn't gather enough courage to do it. Dogs are the natural enemy of cats. Light is the natural enemy of darkness. Life is the natural enemy of death. And what wish could be more natural than a wish to destroy your natural enemy? Ethan stumbled over something. He looked down. And that... A hand was peeking out from behind the kitchen counter, blackened and swollen. Of course, Ethan would have seen more if he had a flashlight. Somehow Ethan wasn't surprised. And if it's him... So, and if it's him, not his friend, who had long ago resigned to his fate. You've received a notice of life termination. It suddenly dawned on him. Madness, curse, and death are contagious. And this is not a dark age superstition, but an actual law of reality. Selene, Hectite, or Hecate. Artemis. Madness, curse, and death. Here lies the accurate answer, as accurate as it gets. The answer is three phases and he himself wished to look into each of them. Ding. A sound of glass breaking in the hall, but it wasn't a window collapsing. The light bulbs. Someone was smashing the light bulbs with a bat one by one. The sound was getting closer. Even closed his eyes. And there was Red Sofa again. Good night. What was the question again? Ending six out of six. Okie dokie. So... When the pursuer eventually ran out of bobs to smash with, his, with their bat, they eventually hit Ethan around the head. 
Don't interfere. Sweat broke out of his upper lip. Ethan closed his eyes. No. Ethan said it was said it with firm clarity. All the following words that came out of his mouth were more and more quiet until his lips moved silently. No, I'm sorry. I can't help. I'm so sorry. He was really sorry. He really was sorry. Something about his former life. Sorry for himself desperately to the point of his stomach clenched with a painful spasm. Sorry for Hope. Sorry for the poor rider who was being dragged deep into the cold vortex of darkness. But what could he, Ethan, do against that darkness? He failed. Maybe he had the skill to get the answers required, but they were buried too deep. At that depth, the water turned pitch black, and there were things in that blackness Ethan didn't know the names of. Didn't want to know. He took a deep breath as if he was actually about to die. Then he deleted the email. Immortal through his work. The letter with the title Untitled disappeared into the dark vortex. The frantic, terrified pleas for help were erased, leaving no trace as if they had never existed. No, it's not like that. They still existed to some form. Hope once told him it was a bad time for Ethan to recall this. The information on the internet doesn't really disappear after you click delete. Most often it remains somewhere on the service and you just lose access to it. You turn the mirror to the wall and pretend like it's your fancy. There was nothing wrong with the reflection. In that case, the silent scream didn't vanish. It was now trapped. Trapped where no one could hear it. I'm so sorry. Ethan covered his face with his hands. The mirror on the wall of Ethan's dark bathroom was reflecting a closed door. Ethan and Hope got an official divorce three months later. They never talked about everything that happened. But what did actually happen? Sometimes this appears and I have no idea why. Over time, the horrors you experienced got erased from memory, fade, weaken. Such are the defense mechanisms of the human psyche. Dad loves you and never stood silently at the head of your bed, clutching a pillow in his hands for some reason. When you were eight, Uncle Jeremy didn't take you behind the barn, didn't show you anything, or make you show anything. But grandmother's old wig did not, so does not, and never has had any long spider legs. Even Psyche had notably suffered, but it was plain by the rules still. He wanted simple, coherent explanations, and he knew where to get them. Dr. Laura Stein was an island of clarity and sanity, and the horrors, as Ethan has described, faded from memory much better if you break them down into fleck symbols, or phallic symbols, sorry. Ethan wished he'd started therapy sooner. Who knows? Maybe most of that nightmare could have been avoided. The police never figured out what happened, but even the clumsy versions suited Ethan much better than what he remembered. What he allegedly remembered. Week after week, Ethan felt like he was gradually recovering. Of course, he had to give up his career as an independent consultant in favor of a more predictable office job, but at least he had the money for proper therapy. And at some point, a small incident happened. Dr. Stein introduced an electronic registration system. As it goes with an electronic registration system, something went wrong on the second or third week. It turned out that three people had an appointment in the same time slot. Mr. Quines, Mr. Harrison, and Mrs. Murley's. The meeting felt awkward at first, but attention faded surprisingly quickly. By mutual agreement, Mr. Quaines was the first to go to Dr. Steins' office. Even Hope were left alone on the couch. They were both smiling, a little tense, but overall happy. Since they met like that, they decided to go out for a coffee and talk about various things, but they haven't spoken in a long time. 
Then at some point they decided to hold hands. The next day, they were hardly keeping their eyes open, because they only managed to sleep for a total of three hours. And that was inevitable, as in a relationship you always had to sacrifice something. Who was that? What? Hope is back here. Hope leaned over the arm of the sofa and looked at Ethan curiously. He shrugged. A literary agency. One of a few I haven't disgraced myself in front of yet. They're looking for enough of a boring guy to be their historical consultant. The working schedule is something about a whole day and most of the night. Seven days a week. So what do they say? That I am a happily employed office worker and I heartedly enjoy cooler water. Are you <laughs> serious? Ethan, don't be silly. We both know this is your true calling. Are you sure about that? I understand this kind of work takes a lot of time, but you could quit the office job and... I could, but I don't want to. It's my turn to bring the mammoth to the cave. What about your calling? I know well enough how hard you work to make this startup of yours survive. Who will make a homeless cat tinder if not you? Well, actually, there is quite a variety of animals in our database. You'd be surprised. Recently, someone has booked a mini pig. A mini pig? A mini pig? Like an actual pig but portable? Yeah, well, kind of. The mini part stands for 100 pounds instead of a good 600. Okay. <laughs> People get crazy over cute piglet photos and think this is it. But in reality, wait a minute. Don't try to change the subject. I don't even think about it. Hope side frowning. I don't want you to give up on your dream. I'm not giving up on anything. And anyway, I do understand that Miss Merleys won't marry an ordinary office clerk. But I have a plan. Oh, come on. A soft cushion slapped against Ethan's cheek. Hope tried her best to look serious, but she was too pleased to put it off. Besides, she was burning with curiosity. What's the plan? I'm writing a book on mythology. Wow. So now you're not only a popular history consultant, but also a talented writer. Yep. Guess I'll start getting used to that thought. <laughs> Ethan grinned. Something of that sort, yes. And what's your future bestseller about? Oh, it seemed to hope, just for a brief moment, that Ethan's eyes became round and shiny paws of black Nakia. The Sionic Gods of Ancient Greece. Or the Catonic gods of ancient Greece. I'm not sure how to pronounce that word properly. Whoa, warped images again. Hope and Nightmare, ending four out of six. Blue Lights Hotel. Do you want to go back? What is with these sudden TV commercials that happen throughout the game? Something changed. Something always changes. Insulina Poptasis. Now, we're going to have to go to the last, last choice if we're going to make anything different. This isn't his house. Maybe he pays for it, but it's not his house. Okay, so the last time we clicked on Refuse, it would come up with that email template system, and we couldn't actually click on it. And even if the house was his, would everything have changed? It's easy to put the blame on the landlady. The landlady would have a fit, and he would have to find a new hole to crawl in and forget about the dis deposit too. But was she the real problem? No. The problem was that he couldn't even take care of himself. Take care of something else is a much bigger task, even if it's just for one night. But then again, sometimes looking after something, like a cat or a dog, can actually be something that can reverse and you help yourself as well because of that interaction sometimes loneliness is that one core element that is dragging you down and that having a companion like a cat or a dog is very healthy for that individual not always for everyone 
but for some people it works out like a charm. No, I'm sorry, I can't let you in. She must have just shaken her head to dry off, but he thought she nodded. I understand. And that is that. When the door lock clicked, he felt a pain of guilt. Nope. Did he do the right thing? Yes. You stopped yourself from a series of unfortunate and untimely demisable effects. Event so he had no answer. He should have put some bedding for her on the porch, he thought, but a sudden wave of fatigue swept him off his feet. He somehow made it to the living room and collapsed on the couch. I would close that window if I were you, otherwise that cat's just going to make its way in. The body, too light and too heavy, fell through the upholstery fabric, the felt layer, the row of compressed springs, the wooden frame. He kept falling, falling, falling into the pitch blackness until it closed over him like a smooth dome. The body... What? He wasn't dreaming. Why does he sometimes go to like this? He wasn't dreaming. Enter the labyrinth, the first ending. And what could possibly be... Excuse me? No. Why are you giving us this? Why are we reverted back to this choice? You know, the nightmares happen after we let her in. Really, game? You're going to allow us to do this? Memories and dreams alike fade away. Just just allow us to make our own destinies as we go forward in life, rather than being dictated by a code or programming. Ugh, for goodness sakes, game. So that is the first ending. As the game would say, enter the labyrinth for first ending. 10.9% of players have achieved this. So what do we do in this case? What do we do in this scenario? Well, I think for the time being, we're going to leave this episode off here and see what other outcomes we can get from this game. So we've achieved endings four and six alongside five as well. No, two, two, four and s two. Yeah, the last ep episode contained ending two and this episode contains four six and possibly one as well but then again it would have ending one of six on it wouldn't it so there we go but i think that the source of these hallucinations and nightmares are to deal with the girl that we see in front of us like any time that our protagonist or ethan has some kind of involvement towards like the mystery of who this individual is could be sophie wolf then these hallucinations and madnesses start happening. And for some odd reason, she could have like a reincarnated spirit of some kind of dark prophet of an ancient Greek time. Something along those lines, which really resembles something really, really bad and really, really uncanny. That uncanny feeling. Despite the fact that she is cute she is also heinous especially about the fact that she made her way into Ethan and hope's apartment and literally stood there seductively at Ethan. like for goodness sakes i wouldn't know what would happen if we had the um one of the dlcs installed for goodness sakes thank you so much for watching and see you all in the next time of celine apoptosis thank you all so much for watching and take care of yourselves